Good morning, everyone. It's, I'm glad to see there are at least a few of you here in the throes of week 12 and assignment two and all your other exams. Um, so you'll remember at the very beginning of yesterday's lecture, we talked a little small bit about optimization. And of course, I'm not Melbourne Uni's resident expert on optimization, so I thought that I would find someone who knows a little more about optimization in the context of a specific domain. And remember, we talked a little about machine learning. So here we have uh, one of uh, Melbourne University's brightest, uh, brightest and, slight, and on the older edge of the end of the stars. Um, this is, of course, Professor Tom Drummond, who is a professor at uh, Melbourne Connect and is, in fact, the, let me get this out correctly, the Melbourne Connect Chair of Digital Innovation for Society at the University of Melbourne. Now, uh, he also has the distinguished honor of being the former head of Department of Electrical and Computer Systems Engineering at Monash University, as well as the former uh, Monash node leader for the ARC Center of Excellence in Robotic Vision. So this is the study of how to help computers understand the world around them by, through image processing. So today he's going to give us a bit of a talk about deep learning, which can be viewed as one form of an optimization problem. So this is a, what it looks like if you take the algorithm, algorithms that we've been studying and take them to their logical extreme. How far can you push it? With a lot and a lot of data. And with that, can I please have a uh, big round of applause for Professor Tom Drummond. Thanks, folks. All right, um, so yes, I work in computer vision, um, and since 2012, computer vision is dominated by deep learning. Um, so I'll talk a little bit, the lecture will start on a very sort of didactic thing about continuous optimization and what that looks like, and then we'll look at what that looks like in the context of deep learning, and then I'll end up on some sort of personal stuff that I've worked on um, that's interesting specifically to me. So it will go from the very general to the rather specific. Uh, so so in, in optimization, we're often faced with systems where we can control some things and we can measure some things. Um, so on the left, we've got the things we can control, and on the right, we've got uh, the things we can measure. So if you're driving a car, then the things you can control, the knobs, are the steering wheel, which kind of looks like a knob, um, the throttle and the brake, which don't really look like knobs, but we'll go with it, and the clutch and the gear stick if you drive a manual. Um, and so what we're left with is a situation where we want to end up somewhere, literally in our car or um, in a system, we want the outputs to read certain things. So maybe we're controlling a chemical plant and we want this to be within some range, and this dial to be within some range, and so on. Uh, and so what we want to do is figure out how to adjust the knobs so that the outputs have their desired values. This is, this is the game. Um, so first of all, we need to say, well, where are the dials now, and where should they be? Okay, so this is, this is where, do I, where am I, and where do I need to get to? Where is the car now, versus where do I live, and I want to drive home, for example or um, uh, which gauges are out of range in the chemical plant. So what do we do? Well, we're faced with these knobs, and for the moment, we'll say we know nothing about the system. And so the question is, what happens then? Uh, we need to, we're gonna figure out what the knobs do. So we try twiddling one of them, and it moves the, moves the dials, right? So I'll just do that one again. We move the knob, and it moves the dials. And so we can record, how these dials move, they all went to the right, that's kind of plus one, if I move the knob to the right, which was plus one. Um, I can do the same with the second knob, um, and now I get something different. So uh, these two again move to the right, this one moved to the left. I can do the same with the third knob, and I might find, we'll do that one again so you can see it, this dial was moving a lot faster um, than the other two. So that was moving two to the left for every unit that I move it to the right. Um, now, in the language of optimization, this set of numbers is called a Jacobian. It is a matrix of partial derivatives, which is what that means is how much does each output vary with respect to each knob? So if I do the first knob, how much are they moving, second knob, and so on. So this dial 
has partial derivatives of 1, 1, and minus 1 with respect to the three knobs. And the reason we care about this is we make an assumption that if I do some small combination of the dials, then I get that combination of this effect. Um, so mathematically, um, that looks like this. So I'm going to do plus 1 to this dial, minus 1 to this dial, and minus 1 to this dial. So I should get, um, I should get one of these, minus one of these, and minus one of these in the total effect. Um, and mathematically, this is the one equation for this slide deck. This is what this looks like. So I have this, this is this set of numbers in a matrix. One, um, hang on, one, two, two. That's the amount I'm gonna move the dials, sorry. I've got this wrong, and that gives me um, one, one, two in the output. So let's try that. So I can get, I can um, move the dials and the outputs move accordingly. Okay, um, so that's, that's kind of a very general situation. Um, sometimes we have fewer dials than things we want to control. Um, so we have more, sorry, fewer knobs than dials. So I can only can control a couple of knobs and I've got lots of dials. So I've got no hope of getting them all to where I want them to be. And so we have some kind of optimization, and often we might say we want you know, the sum of the squared errors to be minimized or something like that. We want them to be as close on average to where they should be as possible. Sometimes it's the other way around. Um, I have more, dial, more knobs than dials, more knobs than dials. Uh, and then I've got lots of ways of twiddling the knobs to make the dials move. And typically what I want to do is make the smallest adjustment to all of the knobs to get the dials to where they want to go. Um, and that's the situation we find ourselves in in deep learning. Um, so, well, what, what are the knobs and dials in deep learning? Um, so there's the basic operation of what's called a convolutional neural network. So this is... Uh, one of two major approaches in computer vision, uh, which is processing images uh, to understand them. Um, and the basic operation in a convolutional neural network is called convolution. Uh, and we have our image here. Uh, and we're going to apply what's called a kernel, which is a three by three block of numbers to this image. And the way we do that is we plonk those, that block of nine squares down over the top left-hand corner of the image. Every number lands on a number in the image, and we multiply them together, and we add them all up. So now the image is all zeros here, so it's a bit boring. The sum is not so very interesting. So I get minus one times zero, zero times zero, one times zero, minus two times zero, zero times zero, two times zero, Minus one times zero, zero times zero, and one times zero, which is all this. And the answer is zero. And so we get the answer, and we put it in the first slot of our output. And then we slide along one. So we move to here. Um, now we get a number that's not zero, because eight of these things still land on the zeros here. But one of them, that one in the corner, lands on the 90. Um, which was a brighter square in our original image. And so we get lots of things times zero, and then at the end we get a one times a 90, which gives us the answer 90 here. And that goes in this. So this is the basic operation. Now, I'm lying in a couple of ways. First is actually we're not dealing with just monochrome images. We're dealing with color images. So there's a red, a green, and a blue plane in the images. So actually, this thing has a stack of three numbers in it. So it's got 27 numbers in it, but it's kind of harder to draw on a slide, so we'll pretend the image is 2D. Um, and so it's got a red, the kernel has a red, a green, and a blue layer to it. Actually, deeper in the neural network, we'll have far more than three channels, we'll have 64 or 128 or even bigger numbers than that. Um, but again, it's the same idea. If we had 64 channels, then we'll have a stack of 64 of these things. Um, and we 
plonk it down and we do some huge number of multiplications uh, and then an ad and additions and then we get the output number. So what are the knobs? The knobs are these numbers. So in deep learning, what we're doing is we are adjusting the numbers that get used in the kernel for the convolution. Okay, so if I, um, if I take this dial and I turn it, then I can change the one in that corner into a two um, by turning the knob. And if I turn it a little bit halfway, it would be 1.5. These aren't just restricted to integers, but I'm using that to get the picture. So that's, that's the basic thing we're learning. Um, and this is actually a kind of a simplified depiction of the neural network that changed the world in 2012. So this is a depiction of a thing called AlexNet, because um, it was created by somebody called Alex Krzyzewski. Uh, and it was addressing a thing called the ImageNet Large Scale Vision Challenge. And that is a challenge to recognize what's in the, the predominant entity in images. Uh, and the way that this system, the way that this challenge ran is the, the challenge organizers distributed about 1.4 million images. Um, and those images were, each of them were in one of a thousand classes. Um, and so the classes were things like bicycle or motorbike or train. Uh, there were various specific breeds of cats and dogs. There were other animals. Um, there are cherries and so on. Um, so there are a thousand different classes in this. So there's about 1,400 images per class in the training set. And then there was a withheld test set. Uh, and the, what you had to do was build your system using this data, and then you tested it on the test data uh, to see how it performed. And until deep learning was really unleashed in force, the best solutions were massively hand-engineered systems, very, very complicated systems, lots of human programmer time um, designing them uh, and carefully tweaking them to be optimal. Um, and what they used to do, because it's a really tough thing to do, or at least it was considered to be tough at that time, was they would give you, I think it was five guesses out of the thousands. So you got to have five guesses. If you were correct in one of your five guesses, your top five, then you got a tick, otherwise you get a cross. And so they were scoring top five performance. And typically, hand-engineered systems had a performance of 25% error rate. So they got 75% of their test samples correct in the top five. This system came along and it knocked that down to 15% error rate. Um, and the, the changes in error rate for the human design systems, they were competing with 0.1 or 0.2 of a percent. They were not big. So cutting 10% off that was a complete change uh, into the system. These days, the error rate is actually um, down to about 3%, um, and about 5% of the data is mislabeled. So uh, it turns out humans operate at 5%. So machines actually can solve this task better than humans. Okay, so what does it look like to train this system on um, using the sort of knobs and dials approach? What we have is a bunch of layers and in each layer, we do a convolution. So this red thing is where all the knobs are. These are the numbers we can change. And they respond to the brightness and color of pixels in some patch in the image. And then we slide that patch all over to get a bunch, a bunch of answers. Now, because mathematically, that's a linear operation. If you stack a bunch of linear operations, you end up with a linear operation. What you do is you make the negative numbers be 0 afterwards. So it's called RELU, um, Rectified Linear Unit, is what that stands for. But it, the operation is, if it's positive, keep the number. If it's negative, make it be zero. Um, and that's a nonlinearity, right? So all the, all the negative numbers are zero. When we hit zero, the positive numbers return their own value. So the function has that kind of angled shape. Um, and then so we have a bunch, actually you have a bunch of filters that generate a bunch of channels. So 
These filters, I think, were 11 by 11 by three input channels, and there were a stack of, I don't know, something like 16 of them um, that generate 16 channels here. And then here we have a filter that some number, let's say seven by seven by therefore 16, but there is a stack of 64 of those, or 32 and then 64 of those. Um, so there's a lot of parameters in this system. It turns out you end up with something like 100 million parameters controlling. So there are 100 million knobs that control the performance of a system like this. Um, that's the knobs. What are the dials? At the end, well, in this one I've got two numbers, right? Is it a cat or is it a dog? Um, in ImageNet there would be a thousand numbers saying how much do I think it's each class? Um, and I've turned these into probabilities, but actually what the system spits out are unnormalized log probabilities. Um, how to expl explain that? For dogs and cats, let's suppose the number for cats was three and the number for dogs was four. What that tells you is because the number for dogs was one more than the number for cats, it's E times more likely, 2.818 something, 28 times more likely um, to be a dog than a cat, which is not 92% and 8%, it would be something more like 70% um, and 30% or something like that. Um, and so what we do is we show the thing a picture of a dog and it, it we start with random numbers in all the red, the red bits are all of the, where all the knobs are, the white bits are where all the results are, and that's like the working memory. And we get some answer, um, which is of course wrong to start with because we put random numbers in, we set the dials to random initialization. But what we now do is we imagine, and you don't do this, twiddle each of those dials, 100 million dial, knobs one at a time, and you see whether the dial, the output, um, comes closer to the answer you want. Does the number for dogs go up? Because we happen to know this is a dog. And if the number for dogs goes up and the number for cats goes down, that's what we want. And then we show the thing, a picture of a cat, and we do the opposite. We say the number for cats should go up and the number for dogs should go down. Um, and you do this, you've got, you got 1.4 million pieces of data, you do it, uh, hundreds of times, you show it, you show it all that data a hundred times over, so it learns again and again and again, uh, and eventually it learns patterns for what makes dogs and cats look like dogs and cats, and of course bicycles and aeroplanes and all the other, other things. Um, it amused me one day, turns out there are people on the internet with far too much time on their hands, um, and so I found photoshopped examples of cat dogs um, and so you can show cat dogs to the uh, classifier and it gets confused. It says, I don't know if it's a dog or a cat. Um, this, is, this is really challenging. Um, um, unfortunately, one of the, and we'll come back to this at a slightly later part of this talk. I should keep an eye on the time. Um, unfortunately, um, there are things, you know, it does the same thing if there are things in the data set it's never seen. So if it's never seen, um, I don't know, let's imagine the Eiffel Tower is a category and it's never seen pictures of the Eiffel Tower or any tower, um, then it might say, oh, I've never seen anything like this. It could be a dog, could be a cat, um, which is unhelpful. And so there's actually a difference between these kinds of uncertainty um, that we'll come back to in a minute. So this kind of uncertainty is, it looks awfully like two different things and I can't tell which it is. Uh, the other is it looks nothing like anything I've ever seen before, so it could be anything. And of course, what it probably is is something, a new category of object that we've never encountered before rather than one of our existing categories. Um, so the question is, well, how might we be able to tell that? So um, these things, uh, you know, AlexNet was, I don't know, 100 million parameters. Um, there won't be a person in this room who has failed to hear about ChatGPT um, and large language models. In language models, it's a very similar, there are a similar set of things. I said there were two architectures. There's convolution and there's 
a thing called transformers, which actually casts attention out across the whole image and pulls data back. Um, that's the predominant technology in large language models. The other technology for large language models are the thing called long LSTMs, long short-term memories, um, that's a, which is a confusing title. Um, but it turns out actually transformers are, have kind of won the architecture race there. But again, it's a similar kind of idea, except language is kind of a one-dimensional thing rather than a two-dimensional thing, right? We have a stream of symbols. Um, we chop, the, chop that text up into words or word fragments. Um, uh, it turns out there are too many words to, to, be, to usefully chop the thing up into words. I don't know, there's roughly about a million um, things that look like words if you even stick to the English part of the web. Um, actually, possibly more than a million, um, whereas we want, want something down in the tens of thousands. So we find common letter sequences and we chop long words up into chunks. Um, so eously might be a chunk at the end of obviously or something. Um, those language models now have parameter counts up into the trillions. Um, so these are truly giant things. Um, GPT-3, which we have data on, unlike 3.5 or 4, GPT-3 had 175 billion parameters. So that was one-eighth, a bit more than a sixth, roughly, of a trillion. Um, that cost of the order of 5 million US dollars to train. It consumed the same amount of electricity as an average Australian home would use in 40 years. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, so heating, uh, global warming issues aside, these things are monstrous, and they're not accessible to the likes of us easily to train. Um, similarly, language, so similarly, vision models have also got pretty large, uh, although perhaps not quite that big. Um, so... This is a situation where, you know, even with AlexNet, we have, let me get this correct, 100 million knobs that we can control and 1,000 dials, 1,000 categories of object that we wish to measure and set to the right value. And what we can't do, I mean, back here where I had this thing, the, if we want to achieve a something here, we end up with this matrix equation, right? This is what we did do. This is where we ended up, and this was, this was our, what we measured about our system. We can figure out what this should be by taking the inverse of this matrix times what we want. Now, you can't do that in, in deep learning because the, you know, you've got 1.4 million examples, you've got 100 million parameters. This matrix has hundreds of trillions of entries if you were able even to compute it. Um, so what you do is you split your data up into what are called mini-batches. So you take 10 or 100 examples at a time. You put those through the system, and now we need to figure out how do these number ch numbers change if I were to change each of these parameters. And I can't afford to wiggle them one at a time, so what do I do? So let's, let's take one example. I've got this example, and it comes through, and I can say, ah, um, I want the number for dog to go up because it's a dog. So if I know that, then I can work out how that number increases if I increase each of these things. Um, because these things are just multiplied by whatever was here. Um, so I, if the number was big here, then I want to increase the number. If the number was negative here, then I want to decrease the number. Then I can work out how I want the numbers in this white block to change, because I know what the numbers in this red, if you like, kernel are, and I can work out whether these should go up or down. And then from that, I can work out, I know what these values were, I know how I want these ones to change, I can work out what should happen to the numbers in this red section here, which ones need to go up or down, and I can work out whether I want these ones to go up or down. Um, and then I can use that to figure out how these should change, figure out how these should change, and I work my way back to the image. 
Um, this is an, an algorithm called backprop. It's backwards propagation. So we start by saying, how do we want the answer to change? And we steadily work our way back and say, how do we want each layer in the network to change in order to get us closer to the answer we want um, at the end of the day? Um, and we don't do any matrix inversion. What we do is we say, OK, for this example, you know, increasing some number in there would take me in the right direction, so I just increase it a little bit um, in proportion to how much it takes me in the right direction, multiplied by a thing called the learning rate, which is often some tiny lumber, like one over a million or something. Um, and that takes us a little bit in the direction we want to go, and I show it another example, um, and I can say, oh, I guess I can adjust the numbers this way. To speed things up, what I do is I show it 100 examples at once, and I average what they want together, and I make those adjustments, and then I show it another 100 examples, and I average what they want, and that takes me all in the right direction. OK, so that's backprop. Um, something that fascinates me. So that's if you want to solve, um, solve a classification problem. So you want to tell me what's in an image. Um, maybe you have photographed you know, a rare bird on holiday and you want to put it into the search engine and say, hey, what was this? I don't know what species of bird this was. It looks very unusual. Um, and so you want the system to classify the image and say this was a whatever it is. I'm not a birder, so I can't give you examples of uh, real species of birds, but you get the idea. But in the case of, in the case of birds, you might come along you know, we might have a data set that we train our system on, but then there might be species it's never seen, right? So this is, this is the I've never seen this before problem versus this I can't tell whether this is one of these or one of those problem. Um, so what do we do? Oh, I apologize, sorry. Was that just on me? That was just on me. Um, what we do is we take off this classification layer at the end and we treat the last set of numbers, which is like a vector of 64 numbers or 1,024 numbers, always powers of two, we like powers of two, or possibly even 4,096 numbers if it was AlexNet. We're gonna treat that vector, and what we're gonna do is use that to be, if you like, the essence of the image in some way. Essence meaning it captures the semantic, the the things that are present in the image rather than the geometry and the patterns that are present in the image. So, you know, here is the, here is the kind of the, the prototypical situation, right? We put in some reference image that goes through our network and we're going to store it in a database. Um, so these are vectors of whatever length of numbers that go into this database. Uh, and then later on, we're going to come along with another image uh, and we put that through our system and we get a vector. And what we want now is to retrieve nearby vectors from our database, things that look like the image we've just put in. Um, and so our system should return, you know, ideally the closest image, but other images that may be nearby as well. Um, so there's a, there's a question as to, well, how do we make this system put things that are like each other near each other. Uh, we, want, we want things, you know, imagine you're, you got, you're getting random dots on a map, um, and what I'm going to do is have uh, green, cat, green dots for cats and red dots for dogs and blue dots for dolphins or whatever it is. Uh, now what I want is to change this network so that green dots live near each other and red dots live near each other and blue dots live near each other. So that the things I know are in different classes are in clusters. Um, so this is, this is the game we're going to play. And how do we do it? Well, um, we can take examples and put them in the database. And then what we can do is we can remove this dot and query everything else around us and kind of blur it out. So we can make a sort of a blurry map, and we can say, well, locally, there's a lot of yellow stuff, quite a lot of red stuff, and a bit of green stuff. But this thing is, should be a green dot. 
So this thing, the output, that should move in this direction. And that's uh, where do I want it to be? That's, the, that's what the dial is in this system. So we can do that and we can make uh, cats be near other cats. Um, one of the nice properties of this kind of thing is that actually you can have more than one blob. So there are two red blobs and two blue blobs. And we, when we did this with ImageNet, we found, for example, dolphins. Um, there are two kinds of pictures of dolphins that people take. There are dolphins doing tricks, and then there are dolphins swimming underwater. And they're quite characteristically different kinds of pictures. And so you end up with just two blobs in the space. And then if you have a new picture of a dolphin, if it's a dolphin doing a trick, it'll land in the dolphins doing tricks blobs. And if it's a dolphin swimming underwater, then it will land in the dolphins swimming underwater blobs, most probably. So you can do this. And again, it's a training system. You show lots of data to the system. And um, you, can, you can then use this to cluster. Now, these are some results from an experiment we ran where we trained it on species of birds. So there's a birds data set. Um, so we trained it to cluster species of birds and then we threw all that data away and we used another set of species of birds. So we had 200 species, we trained on 100, threw those away and then we just put the new, new species through to see if they still land up near each other. Um, so these are, these are in fact the unseen species um, and you do indeed, this is a kind of a 2D representation, the mapping, it sits in a more dimensions than two space, but do we need to dim these lights a bit? It's a little tricky to is it? it? Okay, that's all right. Can you, can you see these clearly enough? Okay, it's all right, I'm getting nods. At least I've got one nod, that'll do. Oh yeah, nice one, okay, cool, cool. Um, and you can do the same with cars, so you can end up, this is very blurry. Um, you can end up with, you know, all the sort of big SUVs on one side and the sports cars are up the top and the trucks are here and uh, the vans are there and so on. So you end up with things getting clustered actually to like with like. Why would you want to do this? Well, one of the reasons you want to do it is it helps with explainability. So previously, you might train a system to classify pictures of skin lesions and say which ones are melanomas. Um, and the system would say, it's a melanoma. And you'd say, why? And it would say, because this number was 10 and that number was minus 3 and this number was 37. And it would give you hundreds of millions of numbers and it would not actually help to understand why it had made that decision. But with a system like this, you can say, well, why do you think it's a melanoma? And it can say, well, you trained me on these examples. And of the 10 nearest, eight of them were melanomas. And here they are. Or this looks like a cat. Why do you think that? Because of all the things that you've shown me, these are the things most similar to this current image I'm seeing, according to my database. And they were all cats. And here they are. Um, so that gives you some kind of explainability. We can then, as an expert, agree or disagree whether these pictures look like the one that we've just presented the system, but it gives us at least a handle on why the system is giving us the answer it is giving us. Um, and I promised to talk about the two kinds of uncertainty earlier. Um, so we talk about aleatric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. Um, it took me a long time to actually figure out why aleatric. So um, famously, Julius Caesar, when crossing the Rubicon to storm Rome with his army, said, alia yacta est, um, which is often translated as the die is cast. Actually, alia is plural and it's backgammon dice, so it's maybe the game has begun is a better translation. So alia are backgammon guys, dice. Um, and the idea of aleatric uncertainty is that no amount of learning more about the thing will give you, will reduce your spread of uncertainty. If I, I can study the dice really hard and still not be able to tell you what number I'll get when I roll it. Um, so that's this situation, right? I'm surrounded by things that are different. These are the different rolls of the dice or whatever it is or the different species and 
the thing I have just looks like all these different species, and they all rather look like each other. I, haven't, I, can't, I can't separate them. Um, so this is aleatoric uncertainty. Um, there's, there's, I can't learn more about this white thing, really, to, to tell you what it is. This is epistemic uncertainty. This, in this situation, I've got, this is something I've never seen before. And it lands in a big old empty part of the space. And it doesn't look like anything. Now, a naive system would say this could be red or purple or blue. And a naive system would say this could be red or purple or blue. And it wouldn't be able to tell you that there's a difference between these situations. But here, if the, if the space is empty, you can say, actually, I know I don't know. Um, and Donald Rumsfeld, who probably is before everybody's time here, comes to mind. He said, there are the things we know, the known knowns. There are the things we know we don't know, known unknowns. And then there are things we don't know we don't know. We don't even know we don't know them. Um, uh, the unknown unknowns. Um, so here, we would know we don't know. Um, and we can learn about it. Um, there's a field called active learning. Uh, and this is how this works. So this is, this is a you know, situation, open set, lifelong learning. We go around, we're going to encounter new things. Um, some of the new things, we might have to ask somebody, what is it? Hey, this is a very strange fruit. I have never seen this fruit before. What is it? Um, it might be something that's exotic to me. So in the computer world, what does this mean? You train your network on a few classes and you cluster. Um, then we go and observe more things in the world. We find more things. And some of them are, you know, that's a dog. The red things are dogs. It kind of lands somewhere near the red things, but a bit, little bit far away, and it could be green. Um, we've never seen rabbits before, so we end up spotting rabbits, and that forms this part of the space. Whatever this is, it's a cat, I'm guessing, because the yellow things are cats. This is probably a cat, right? It lands, it's landed near three other things that are cats. We can guess what that is. Um, this, again, might be a new thing. Or maybe it's purple. We don't know. Um, so we've done that. Now, here's the thing. We can't ask about everything. You know, if I go through, the, through my life saying, oh, there's a new thing. What's this? What's that? What's that? I become like a five-year-old saying, why? Why? Um, it becomes tiresome. And it's, you know, it's effectively, it's expensive to ask somebody what is or something. You know, there's a cost to it. So we want to minimize that. So what we're going to do is we are going to pick the gray dots that are near other gray dots, so they're going to be informative, but not near colored dots that we know stuff about. So we want to maximize the local density of gray, gray stuff and minimize the local density of colored stuff. Um, and so we might ask about a couple of these. We might ask about a couple of these, and we might ask about this one. So the system says, aha, well, this is, uh, these things are, no, that's bright, it's a bright pink, it's different from different class from this. These things are a new thing called rabbits, this thing is a new thing called motorbike, and this one over here, that's a dog, you've seen those before. Uh, now we've got a bit more data, we can reshape our space, reshape our network a bit, so that the purple thing, the new pink things move, you know, things move away to create space around it because they're different. Um, these things move away. The red dot moves up towards near the other red dots, and it start, continues to map things together. So this is, this is a situation called active learning. And it turns out that if you do this then, and you have a limited budget of new labels that you can ask questions about, um, then this is a very good way of allocating those questions to the examples that you've been exposed to so that you can then perform maximally well on a withheld set that contains stuff you've already seen and stuff that's new. Okay, I will finish there as I think we are very close to time, but maybe... Still got, still got a little while. Do I? Okay, I'm still I'm going to finish there. Um, yeah, we've got another 10 minutes, that's fine. We'll take questions. Do you have an online channel for uh, streamers to ask questions? Oh, you have a question, right? That's right, yes. Um, I'm just curious because I think in yesterday's lecture, we were talking about how in optimization you try and get stuff at like bulk cost. Oh, yes. Local minima, we call those, yes. Minima, yeah. So how would you try and 
end up with a result where they've achieved those symptoms and they've got that raw kind of hospitalisation rather than that kind of comfort of that follow up time. Right. That, oh, that's a million dollar question, right? That is something that has plagued um, machine learning people for a long time. And there are two parts to the answer to that. One of the things that ha seems to happen when you have just giant numbers of parameters is that those minima go away. So you might imagine, you know, here is my, min here is my local minimum and here is the global minimum, and I'm stuck here. But in the, in if I add another dimension, maybe I can walk around that mountain that's between me and the global minimum somewhere and always keep going downhill to get to it. Um, and what we've done is not just added one extra dimension, but billions of them. And often there is a, another path around. Then there are tricks. So I, you know, we, we often describe it as uh, here is where we want to be. Where we want to be is everything perfectly labeled. Um, and we have a thing called a loss, which is how, how much do we miss that by? Um, in deep learning, we use the loss is the negative of the log of the probability that we assign to what it really is. So if we said it's um, 0.5 a cat and it's really a cat, then the penalty we pay is, well, we take the log of 0.5. Um, I can't do that in my head, but it's some number like minus 0.7. Um, and we do minus that, so the loss we pay is 0.7. If our probability goes down, that log becomes more negative and the loss becomes more positive. So that's, that's the way we, uh, way we optimize it. So we have this gradient descent issue. Um, one of the things we do as a trick in deep learning is to add a thing, what's called momentum. So if we keep going downhill, we'll go faster and faster and faster, and the idea is if we get to that local minimum, we have enough momentum to get out and escape down the other side. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the tricks that people use. Um, then there are a bunch of things that have the net effect of kind of smoothing out the landscape. One of the ways we do that is we can add a lot of noise into the system. Um, so we can add either noise to the pixels we put in or we can add noise to the numbers that we use, or we can add noise to the values, the intermediate values we compute. Um, in AlexNet, actually, one of the tricks they used was to randomly set half of the values to zero um, as, as it went through. So it just, bang, you don't, see, you don't see this data. And that forces it to kind of distribute its, its understanding about what's happening. It doesn't put it all in some one key value, it distributes it across a lot of values. Um, that might not sound like it's called regularization, um, and that has the effect of kind of smoothing out the landscape, and then a lot of the local minima kind of disappear. Um, so that's another trick that people use. Yes? Ah, oh, so yes, I have not talked about instance recognition or semantic segmentation at all. Um, so these are classes of activity that matter for most real-world activities. So I have students who work in autonomous driving vehicles. There, it's a road scene, is an unhelpful piece of information. What you want to know is, there's a car here, there's a car here, there's a car here, there's a pedestrian there, there's a bicycle here. Um, and, you know, which pixels belong to which thing. Um, that is a thing called, that's a task called instance segmentation. I've got three cars and I want to wear, know, know where each of them is. Um, typically we break the world up into stuff and things. Stuff is continuous like tarmac or grass or sky. Things are countable like people and bicycles. Um, so there what we do is our ground truth is not just, our label is not just one label per image. Often we can't be bothered to paint the pixels, so what we do is we put a rectangle around the object and we say, there's a pedestrian here, another rectangle, there's a pedestrian there, there's a pedestrian here, here's a bicycle, there's a truck, here's a bus, here's a building, here's a stop sign. Um, and we label all of the things that matter to us in the image. And then what our neural network does is it has to spit out, here are a bunch of things I think are in this image, here is where they are, here is what I think they are, 
And then we kind of, behind the scenes, have to match that up as best, you know, what's the best matching um, between the things the network says based on where they are and what it thinks they are to the things that we have said are present. And then we drive it, again, each of that, those errors. There's an error in where are the four sides of the rectangle. There's an error in what kind of objects in the rectangle. And we drive those errors downwards in the same kind of a way. But now there, there's more, if you like, more dials per image um, that, we, that we get to control. Cool. I think we have exhausted the uh, capacity for it. <laughs> it's all right, Shannon. It's, okay. it's all good. Well, so we have another round of applause for uh, Thank you.